Once upon a time, there were three men, all of whom lived on the same street. It was Saturday, and everyone needed to mow their lawn. Neighbor number one didn't want to mow his lawn, but he had to, because he had just received an angry letter from the Homeowners Association threatening that they would fine him if he didn't cut his grass. Well, neighbor number two didn't want to mow his lawn either, because he was enjoying a Saturday of watching college football. But his wife informed him that her mother was coming into town tomorrow, and she needed the lawn to be cut. But if he would do it, she would make him his favorite chocolate cake. Neighbor number three is different. Neighbor number three loves to mow his lawn. He likes the exercise, he enjoys how it looks when he's done, and he enjoys the satisfaction of knowing he's being a good neighbor by doing his part to make the street look great. Now, all three men are motivated, and all three lawns are going to get cut. But who does the best job with their lawn? If you said neighbor number three, you're correct. Well, who blows grass all over the street and doesn't care? Well, that would be neighbor number one. So just because all three men are going to complete the task doesn't mean each task will be completed excellently. And this all has to do with the source of their motivation. You see, human motivation exists on a scale. I'll spare you all the fancy psychological terms, but neighbor number one is experiencing what I call have-to motivation. In other words, it's highly controlled in that if he doesn't get the task done, there's going to be consequences that are detrimental to him. This kind of motivation, when you have to do something, it does get the job done, but it doesn't get the job done with excellence because people inwardly resist the control that's being placed on them. But as we move up the scale, we cross a very important point. It's called the threshold of autonomy, where people move from have to to want to, and this is a significant shift in the source of motivation. Neighbor number two wants to mow his lawn because we have incentivized it, and in this case, that's with a reward of a nice slice of chocolate cake, because this reward is desirable to neighbor number two, it acts as a motivator. But as we move further up the scale, we cross a significant point where we move from want to motivation to get to motivation. And this is where we go from external motivators like cake and threats to internal motivators or what we call intrinsic motivation. And when someone is intrinsically motivated, they're gonna work harder, they're gonna invest more of their heart, energy, and creativity in order to get the job done. And if you wanna know the secret about leading and motivating people, then it's learning to move people from have to, to want to, to get to. Because when you can do that, everything changes. But let's simplify this picture for a moment and take away neighbor number two. And now we're left with have to and get to. So let me ask you a question. What's really the difference between these two neighbors? It's the same day, the same street, they both own the same lawnmower, yet one is going to do an excellent job and the other is, well, not going to be having much fun. So what's the difference? Well, the difference between neighbor number one and neighbor number three is simply how they think about what they do. Because the two men think differently, it affects the source of their motivation. Now think about that. In fact, great leadership is shifting how people think about what they do. Because when you can do that, you become an inspirational leader. But how do you do that? How do you shift an employee's thinking so that it changes the source of their motivation? How do you get them from have to, to want to, to get to? Well, there's a number of ways to do this, but let me quickly just give you one. When you help someone connect what they do with something larger than themselves, it completely changes how they look at the task. And one of the most powerful things to help you do this is to create a link between what they do and the contribution that it makes. So let's go back to neighbor number one. Instead of getting even with the homeowners association, what if we could help him see that keeping his yard looking fantastic is going to help his friend Jerry, who lives directly across the street and is trying to sell his house? Because living across the street from somebody with an unsightly lawn is not appealing to a buyer. Suddenly, now neighbor one begins to make a subtle shift in how he thinks about cutting his lawn. It's not just about the HOA anymore, it's something bigger. When you shift someone's focus from what they have to do to what they get to do, you light a fire that propels them to a greater version of themselves.
So what the three lawn mowers teach us is that it's not enough just to be motivated, but rather the type of motivation will determine the quality of the work produced. And if you like this mini training, then visit jamesrobbins.com for more tips and tools on how to bring out the best in those you